Welcome back to Garden Party, everybody. We're your virtual series from the Southern California News Group to give you tips, tricks, and insights into getting the most joy and productivity out of your gardening experience, and also help you find a community of like-minded green thumbs, or in my case, a wannabe green thumb. Today, we're talking about roses with our gardening columnist, Joshua Siskin. Meanwhile, I'm Sam Dunn. I'm the senior editor of premium content here at the Southern California News Group. And I want to say thank you to our Reader Reward subscribers for supporting our programs. And by the way, if you are a Reader Reward subscriber attending today, you're automatically entered to win a $100 gift card to Home Depot, which should come in handy for your gardening needs. And wait, if you're not a subscriber, why aren't you a subscriber? Go to scng.com forward slash subscribe to find your local paper and join us as a subscriber. So before we get started, I need to tell you a few things. Um, if you're attending uh, today, you're muted, but if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. And certainly if you want to make comments or talk to other people, use the chat feature found there as well. We've got SCNG's feature editor, Eric Peterson, behind the scenes monitoring questions. Hi, Eric. Thank you. And he'll be responding as much as possible. Keep in mind, this is a freewheeling conversation, as you'll see if you haven't joined us before, but you're going to have slides to refer to as we go, and the information is going to be mailed to you, emailed to you rather, uh, after the show. This session will be videotaped, and again, the link's going to be sent to you so you can share it or just revisit some of your favorite moments. It's also posted at scng.com forward slash virtual events, where you can find all of our past virtual shows and see what's coming up next. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our gardening rock star, Joshua Siskin. He's been the gardening columnist for the LA Daily News since 1993. Joshua holds a master's degree in horticulture from UC Davis. He's also been a landscaping and gardening practices instructor for the Los Angeles Unified School District and UCLA Extension, and he owned his own landscaping uh, management company. He's written a book too. It's called Green Skies Under, excuse me, Green Plants Under Smoggy Skies, a guide for the Los Angeles gardener. And he's a licensed psychotherapist, which I like to say is why he's getting, he's good at getting to the root of our gardening issues. All right, forgive the pun. Anyway, hello, Joshua. Where are you, my dear? Hey. Hello. Great to be here. Great to be uh, here. It is so great to be here. So today we're going to talk about, about roses and all their yeah. blooming glory. Here in my neighborhood, they're just going crazy. They look great. Right. But before we get to all the how-tos, please give us some of your wonderful background on these familiar <laughs> flowers that we love and, uh, and maybe don't know as much about as we think. Right, right. So I thought we'd first talk about the etymology or the origin of the word rose, which comes from... Uh, Vareda, which is an ancient Persian word for rose. Uh, Persia was one of the centers of, uh, of uh, ancient rose growing. And then there's the Armenian word vard, and then there's the Greek word rhodon, which you can see the R and the D came from Persian all the way to Greek. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, Samantha, we talk about a rhododendron. Well, rhododendron, yes. it consists of two words. One is rose, which is rhodo. Dendron is tree. So it, a rhododendron bush, we don't have them in Southern California too much, but in the East, the rhododendron bush can grow very large, up to 20 feet, like a tree, okay? And azalea yeah. is related to, to, to rhododendron. You can see it in azalea, it kind of looks like a rose. So that, it's that a petal structure, rhodendron. yeah. Right. So and you were going to say something about Aphrodite? Yeah, so Aphrodite, uh, <laughs> they say that, uh, you know, she had a son named Eros, and Eros is right, is always where it conjures up love, right? I think right. Eros actually is Cupid. I think uh, the, the, the Roman. Yes, right? the Roman version. Uh -huh. right, right. So, but, you know, they said, well, what she did was she took the E from in front of the ro ROS and she put it at the end and she got Rose that came from love. So, I love that story. Yeah. <laughs> ah, so now we come to the habitat, which means where do roses grow? Wild. Well, roses actually grow throughout the world, but only in the Northern Hemisphere. And you don't find mm -hmm. them under the equator, mostly in Asia and Europe, but there are also some that are native to the, to the America and Africa even. Interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a rose native to Alaska. The oldest fossil that they found of a rose they found in Alaska 58 million years ago, and that's known as Rosa acicularis. And so people who live in very cold climates, you can be 
calm that, that, that there are roses that grow in, in sub-zero uh, weather. That's fascinating. Yeah. They're so adaptable. Oh, yeah. speaking of which, here's the cultivation. Well, here's the, so now, we, now we come more to the cultivation. You can see here that there are 200 species of roses. Now there are 30,000 varieties, but the oldest rose in existence is in Germany. It's a Rosa Canina. You can see in the middle picture. Yes. Uh, it means dog rose. Why do they call it dog rose? Because it was it was uh, uh, thought that the the roots of a dog rose would be effective in treating rabies. So they call it the wild rose of Europe is the Rosa Canina or the dog rose. On the okay. left we have uh, the oldest rose in the United States was it's a Lady Banks rose. You've probably seen them. If you've seen this time of yeah. year, yellow roses or white roses, just yeah. uh, a vine that's a vining rose just covered that's what it is this this rose this covered, a, yeah covers it looks like a tree i mean yeah. it's huge it's the, the the circumference of the of the trunk is 12 feet 12 feet around is the trunk and it okay. covers nine thousand square feet and one other point that we have to make though over at the right malmaison was a garden of princess josephine who was Napoleon's, Napoleon's wife. wife. And she was responsible for importing the seeds of roses from China. And this was very important because it was out of the hybrids that between the Chinese roses and the European roses that the modern roses developed. Speaking of which, let's let's go to the next slide and talk about those old yeah, roses. Yeah, well, actually, these are the old roses. Old roses, they're old roses and modern roses, or sometimes they call them uh, heirloom roses. Old roses are roses that were hybridized before 1867. In 1867, they came up with the first hybrid tea. So that's kind of the dividing point between the old roses and the modern roses. But what it, these roses are also hybrids, by the way. And the ones on the top, Gallica, is the oldest. They go in chronological order. And each rose that you see in succession was hybridized from the rose prior to it. So you see there's a there's an escalating uh, right, uh, right, an evolution, if you will. Evolution, and, right. And and you mentioned earlier when we were discussing before we got on that the China rose is really right. pivotal. Can you talk about the that? The China rose was was a major breakthrough because a lot of the color and and shape of roses that we're familiar with comes from the European roses, which are the top five. But the Chinese roses are the ones that rebloom. In other words, the quality of reblooming comes from the Chinese rose. That's fascinating. And that rose came along and made a huge difference in hybridization because- And what we experience roses now, really. Right. So and let's we, move to the modern rose. Excuse right, me. right. So here are the modern roses. Um, hybrid teas uh, were the first modern roses, like we said, in 1867. And those were hybrids from what we call a tea rose and a, and a polyantha rose. A tea rose, some people call hybrid roses tea roses, but there's actually a difference. As we showed on the previous slide, a tea rose is a rose whose flowers smell like brewed tea leaves. So that's mm. how it, the whole idea of a tea rose came to be. And then hybrid, they took tea roses and they took another hybrid rose and they put them together. And hybrid roses are long stem roses with a single rose at the end, right? Those are the roses usually that people give uh, I was going to say the ones that we're acquainted with the FTD floral, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. That's what those are long stem hybrid teas. But what they did then was they um, they took a uh, they crossed hybrid teas with a uh, with a polyantha rose, and they came up with floribundas. Floribundas are the roses are not as big as hybrid teas, but they grow in clusters, and so people are really crazy for those. And they don't grow as tall either. They only grow to three or four feet. So they're easier to take care of. The most common one is iceberg. If you see right, white roses growing in clusters, it's the most planted rose in the world probably by now. And it really is a fantastic rose because it blooms virtually all year long. And you don't really have to do deadheading very much. And it'll still, you know, deadheading is when you cut the old roses right. to promote the growth of new ones. Well, with the with the floral bonnet, it's not really necessary. Uh, it'll, you'll get more roses by doing so, but it'll it will continue to give you roses throughout the year without uh, without uh, necessarily deadheading. As opposed to shrub roses. Shrub roses, right? Shrub roses are probably more in the in the. Uh, I mean, again, I'll, see, shrub is more generic. In other words, you could have some floral abundance among shrub roses. Uh, you could even have 
uh, possibly hybrid teas if you keep them if you keep them shrubby, right? Because you can be right. you can be very flexible with, with the roses. You can make them as big or as little as you want. I mean, not not to exaggerate, but if you want to keep them at a shorter height, you can do that. Um, We'll get to I pruning in a bit, but I want to get to the different types of species before we get to the particulars of uh, yeah. how to I shape just wanted them. to mention a couple of roses here. I wanted to honor Jack Christensen, who used to contribute to the weekly garden column in the, in the LA Daily News, five things to do in the garden this week. He was a outstanding breeder of roses. And two of his roses that he bred were voodoo, which is a hybrid tea orange. You can see it um, right up there in the corner, yeah, right, right in the corner. And then another one was um, a Grandiflora called Gold Metal, which is a uh, which is a yellow rose, and you see it in the bottom right uh, hand corner. So Lovely. I think I think uh, it's 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 nice to remember him because he was a he was a he was a local rose grower of, of right. considerable and, yeah. and and part of the Southern California News Group family. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, he passed away just a year ago. So. Oh. Well, this is a good way to remember him. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. so moving on. Yeah. So, okay, petal count. This is just how to classify. You heard of double, I mean, in terms of, of flowers in general, you'll hear of double flowers or triple flowers. Double just means it has, you know, two layers of petals, right? Yes. I mean, you can even think of marigolds, right? You have two different types of marigolds. You have the the French marigolds, which are the small ones and the single petal, right? Single layer of petals. And then you have the African, which are, well, actually you have some French roses also, but you know, it's, it's more uh -huh. closer. It's more like, like, a, like a fuller uh, a double uh, or even triple layer of petals. So that's just something to be aware of. There's mostly when we think of roses, we think of the more, uh, the double bloom or the full bloom and the, uh -huh. the very full, but there's some really beautiful single roses. You see, one thing I learned about when 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 <laughs> when preparing for this for this uh, presentation, the world of roses is 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 endless. I mean, you could spend uh -huh. a lifetime learning about roses, and and you'd never exhaust the subject. And anybody who's interested, I highly recommend that they take a look at this book. You can get this book online for ten or eleven dollars. It's called the Rose Bible, and it really is the best book on the subject of growing roses. It'll introduce you to all the different varieties, everything you want to know, fertilization, propagation, all the ins and outs. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, let's move on to a little bit more about roses. Yeah. So fragrance, different color roses have different fragrances. The red and the pink roses are, <laughs> smell like roses. What does that mean? They have that, that tea, that kind of that that tea right. fragrance that we associate with rose. I mean, you might not be thinking of tea, but maybe the next time you smell a red rose or a pink rose, you'll think, ah, it does kind of smell. Ah. <laughs> and then the white and yellow have a different, uh, have a different fragrance, the, you know, the violet, the orris, the nasturtium and lemon and orange roses, fruits, violets, nasturtium and clove. So, yeah, and something to remember is that on, yeah, on warm, hot days, you're not gonna smell as much as you do on cooler days. In fact, they say humidity, humidity also brings out the, uh, the, uh, the fragrance. Oh, that's so, fascinating. Yeah, so that's important. If you go to Small Rose for the first time and, and it's on a 90 degree day, it's gonna be different than if it's a, it's a more moderate day. I mean, I was over at my, I have a friend in, in Reseda who grows 400 roses. So <laughs> there was a, a couple of weeks, it was the last week when I, we had these 95 degree temperatures, right? Right. I went over there and it was 11 o'clock in the morning and already a lot of the roses had lost their fragrance because mm. of the heat. Because of the heat. Um, so well, it's just something to keep in mind. Listen, we already have a whole bunch of questions piling up. So right. uh, so <laughs> let us move. Actually, let's skip the, the height really well. Just go yeah, really yeah, yeah. quickly. Um, did you want to mention anything about heights of roses? Well, I, did, I, I just want to draw people's attention to the fact that there, there's something called a mini, the mini floor and the miniatures are the best for containers. And even if you put them in the ground, they're very strong because they grow on their own roots. They're not grafted. Grafted plants tend to be weaker than ones that are not. But if you, mm -hmm. there are mini floors that only grow to a foot and the roses are only an inch wide. So you might want to keep those in mind because they're tougher than they look. Yeah. Yeah, oh, great. And, and let me just mention weeping roses on the right. There's, we, there's one in particular, it's called Bloomfield's Courage, but you can find it online. They're weeping roses. 
that when they're in full bloom in the spring, there are more than a thousand flowers at, at, at one time in bloom. It's yeah. one of the most spectacular sights you've ever seen. So that if you really awesome. want to do something, it's going to be a showstopper, you know, that people are going to stop there and, and take a look uh, and wonder what's, what the heck is going on. Consider growing a weeping tree rose. It's really, it's really a, what do you call it? Pièce de, de résistance. Pièce de résistance. Yeah, <laughs> very good. You're actually I'm, good. I'm glad, well, I lived in France. I'm glad it can come in useful sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Graft, oh, this was fascinating when we were talking about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, right. So the reason graft, why do you even graft roses? Well, some people say that the, the, the rootstock, the type of rose that grows under the one that's grafted onto it gives certain strengths to the plant. But the real reason is it's uh, economical because a grafted rose grows a much quicker than a rose growing on its own roots, okay? So when you when you see a rose in the nursery, it's grafted because it, it's, it's much cheaper for the nursery to bring a rose into production that way. However, the trick is you can have the best of both worlds if you take your grafted rose and you plant it one inch below the soil so that the graft is below the soil. In doing that, the roots of the um, top variety, right, are going right. to grow out of, that, out of that stem above the graft union, right? So you're going to have the roots of the original uh, uh, or the, the cyan rose, the rose that's growing on the top, are gonna be growing into the ground. And so that's gonna give that plant strength that it wouldn't otherwise have growing on the roots of the, uh, of the, of the rose it was grafted to. Fascinating. So let's move on to the next slide. I think, oh, soil and planting. Yeah, yeah. So here we're talking really, you need well-drained soil, of course. You can say that about most plants, although roses do grow in almost any type of soil, you know, but you wanna make, you, you wanna to try to get a well-draining soil. And the only thing we have here is bare root roses is something you really want to think about. People have an aversion to bare root roses because it, you know, when it's in a container, you just take it out of the container, you put it in the pot. But if you want a variety of roses, a huge variety, you have to buy bare root, okay? Because you're gonna have a very limited selection when you go to a nursery, okay? A retail nursery. And the only thing you want to keep in mind with bare roses is that you really have to soak the heck out of them before you plant them. They usually come wrapped in peat moss or, or, or um, uh, uh, wood shavings. You want to soak the heck out of it for 24 hours. And then when you plant it, you also want to keep soaking it for a period of time until you see some, uh, see some growth coming out of it. So soak for 24 hours for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything. And, and Carla Rose asks, are most of these roses available for purchase online. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The ones I, uh, the ones I've referenced, yes, they're popular. Okay. But but okay. thousands more. And at the end, we have a list. I don't know if we're going to get to it, but there's a list of online uh, of mail order nurseries right. where you can find uh, you can find hundreds of of, of rose varieties. Well, yeah. everybody will get that resource um, emailed to them, so we don't have to worry about right, it. Right. Right. Um, so okay. So soil and planting. We have some questions about fertilization too. So let's uh -huh. move on. Okay. So this there is we perfect. go. This is perfect. So, I mean, before I say anything, I have to talk about mulching. Mulch, 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 mulch. Okay, because when you have mulch, the mulch itself decomposes and fertilizes the go the, the soil. This is true of anything. After a few years or a couple years, even you're going to see this. When you pull away the mulch, you're going to see this very very dark soil. Okay, like soil on the forest floor. And that's what you want. And if you have this constant mulch, fertilization is not going to be, what should I say, as much as a do or die proposition. I mean, if you want uh, a lot of roses that are, you know, throughout the growing season, you're going to have to rake away the mulch once a month, every month to six weeks and apply fertilizer. That's true. Okay. You're going to have to do that. And unless you, now if you lose a, a slow release preparation, like Osmocote, okay, you put something down for six months and that, that should last through the growing season. Oh, good. But well, a very expensive listen. product, a, a very expensive product, and, and other people might want to use something different. Uh, and, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you also mentioned aged manure. Compost. Yeah, aged manure and compost. Well, now again, you can use, some people put aged manure over their roses every spring, you know, it's just, it's just the religious uh, 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 right. uh, practice. Ritual, yeah. Ritual, right. And and it's good and and you know if if you just rose if you just fertilize your roses with organic things 
right? And even once a month, take away the um, take away the mulch and put something like nitrohumus, right? Which is a product you can buy in a bag. It's 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 totally decomposed compost, right? You put that around your roses once a month. That's going to be good, okay? But you have to do something. But it's good, you know, to keep the roses really coming the way you want. You need to do it once a month or every six weeks. Epsom salts that. Some people swear by them and some people don't go near them. It's, it's kind of the verdict is out, but definitely newly planted roses, you don't want to put up some salts, but in, in the course of growing, some people do, some people don't. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. well, let me let me just stop for a minute and say, Linda Collar, I, I hope this answers your question about, about fertilization for roses. She also had, Linda also had the question, and is it related to fertilization? Why does her Mr. Lincoln rose grow long, thin, rangy branches? Okay, well, um, my first thought is, is it getting enough sun? Uh -huh. would sure. Wouldn't have any. I mean, some roses can grow in a certain amount of shade, but mm -hmm. ideally the roses really have to be in full sun. So that, that would be my that would be my uh, that would be my guess. Okay, okay, Linda. I hope I hope that helps. But, but there's right. another point too. When you prune your roses in the winter, the, the 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 shorter you prune them, the bigger the roses are going to be in the spring, right? If you just prune your roses a little bit, you're going to get roses in the spring, but they're going to be smaller than if you prune them down to say, oh, I don't know, 18 inches or a foot, right? If you do that, you're going to have a much bigger roses in the in the first uh, flush of the spring. Yeah. What are some of the common misconceptions about pruning for roses? We have a slide. Uh, well, I here. think one of the common misconceptions is that um, you know you have to wait for the rose to go dormant before you can prune it. Uh, dormancy you can create dormancy dormancy by detaching all the leaves. Some, some people think, oh, I gotta wait till the roses go. Well, in Southern California, you might be waiting all, all winter <laughs> because right. you know, that they don't classically go into dormancy because it's it could be too warm. So what you do, you remove all the leaves. Now, once you remove the leaves, buds are going to swell. They're called latent buds. Latent buds are going to swell on the stems. And what you're gonna do, the cuts, the pruning cuts you make are gonna be above latent buds that are gonna to start to swell. But you wanna make sure that the bud that you cut points out to the, to the outside and not to the inside. The direction a bud points is the direction the shoot is gonna grow. And oh. you don't want growth going to the interior because growth going to the interior does not get as much sun as it should. You're gonna create shade and you can create conditions that are favorable to grow to insect pests and uh, fungus disease. So oh. that's that, yeah. So that would be the, but, but I would say one of the misconceptions is that you have to prune them short. You don't have to prune your roses short. You can prune them as tall as you want. Just keep in mind that the, the size of the roses is going to be different. Um, and speaking of rust, actually, we have a question here from someone. Oh, they, they ask, how do you get rid of rust safely without okay, affecting so, surrounding so, so, milkweed? and monarch habitat. Oh, well, the whole thing about safety, with rust, you really have to remove the plants of the, of the parts of the rose that are that are rust infected. I mean, there are chemicals you can spray, but who wants them, you know? It's like they're, they're, they're very uh, kind of noxious, right? Toxic. Right. But the, the point with rust is, and this is something uh, my good friend, Lauren Zelda told me, there are two major uh, uh, rose diseases. There's mildew that starts from the top and rust that starts from the bottom, meaning, if you have a lot of shoots in the bottom of your, at the base of your rows or at the base of your of your, your stems or canes as we refer to them, you know, a rose can, a stem is called a cane. You wanna prune off all the bottom leaves because that's where rust begins, right? Because the water doesn't dry out, right? The moisture mm -hmm. doesn't dry out. You have a lot of congestion. So the point is to remove all the bottom leaves of, uh, mm -hmm. Of, of your of your roses. There's something else I want to say about pruning that, that my friend Lauren reminded me of. There's a lot of growth called, they're called uh, blind shoots or blind growth. What does this mean? If you see a shoot coming out of your rose and there's no flower bud on the end of it, you want to remove yes. it because it's just going to take energy away from the plant. So okay. always remove blind shoots. Be on the lookout for them because they don't do your plant any good and they will. Uh, take away energy from the, from the flowering uh, shoots, flowering. And th this might be a, a good time to ask Diane Rector's question. How do I deal with persistent suckers? 
Ah, <laughs> so here's the thing with soccer. This is the reason that you plant with a bud union below the soil. By doing that, you will remove, I didn't mention that earlier, by doing that, you will prevent the suckers from uh, developing. Now, once the plant, the suckers are already there, uh, there's really not much you can do about it. I mean, some uh. people say, some people say um, that, you know, if you take, I mean, you have to be careful in doing this, but if you take a, I don't know, a really sharp blade, I guess it could be the blade of a, of, of a shovel even, and you kind of chop the, 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 uh, the sucker away from the, so you get sort of, I don't know, how would you call it? The base of the sucker or something like that? You want to be careful uh -huh. not to damage that cane, right? So yeah. If you well, sort of chop it away at its base, you know, then, then you won't get any more canes growing from that point. I see. Okay. But okay. It, it's really tough once, you just have to stay with it and, and, and remove them the, sec the second you see them. You know, right. But once they're about, there, they're there, right? They're going to yeah, keep I mean, coming. You know, Eric, our, 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 um, Editor. our loyal and, uh, and, and capable uh, man behind the scenes was saying the last two weeks he's been in his garden almost every day. You have to be out there every day if you yeah. really want to grow plants successfully. There's no, you can't take a vacation. <laughs> As somebody said, the best fertilizer is the gardener's shadow. Uh, I love that. I love that so much. Uh, it's just like children or 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 oh, animals, yeah, absolutely. any living thing, right? You have exactly, to have constant, exactly exactly any living thing. Yeah, you got this. Yeah, not, constant you know? maintenance. Yes. I love that. <laughs> okay, moving on. Irrigation. Oh, this is a great question. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, I bring in my friend from uh, Nate Benazi, who grows roses in the San Gabriel Mountains Regional Conservancy, the Santa Fe Dam. Actually, this is this is dated. He hasn't he hasn't watered his roses now in three years. Okay? What? Yeah, three he years. How is that now. possible? No. Wow. And they really look good. Huh? So what's the and, secret there? <laughs> the secret there. Well, he's you know he got some really good compost. Uh, the soil actually maybe doesn't drain all that well, but he got some really good compost that mixed with the soil and it, I guess it holds the water really well, but I, but the point we're trying to make here and here's three of the roses that he's drawn. Uh -huh. What we're trying to make here is roses are really drought tolerant plants. Okay. I That's have so interesting. Yeah, no, I, there are neighbors. I have neighbors. Well, that, I don't want to say across the street, but you know, a couple of blocks away. Yeah. They're not really neighbors. They haven't been in the home for three years. It's a bit, you know, they put these signs on there, uh, you know, trespassers uh, uh, not wanted and whatever. Yeah, yeah. But their first blush of roses, which I've seen in the last week or two, the last maybe month or so, is gorgeous. Nobody's put water on those roses in more than three years. But the oh. first blush of roses is still outstanding. Now, to want to get a continual crop of roses all year long, that's something else again. Uh -huh. But I have never seen a wilted rose bush. That is so interesting. And that, that dovetails with what our, one of our guests, Pat Hutter says, uh, Huttner, I'm sorry, Pat, says, yeah. my roses have lived on rainwater only for many years. So there you go. To your point. Yeah, absolutely. And there, I, I should mention, there is a native rose called Rosa Californica, which you can, at the entrance to the LA Zoo, it's planted. It's a it's a wonderful rose because it um first of all it can form a natural fence if you want to if you want to if you want to fence around your property but you don't want to have to electrify it just plant Rosa California <laughs> and it'll 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 keep out intruders and it has wonderful hips not every rose produces hips of uh, that are that are noteworthy but this one does and you know rose hips are the, just another word for the fruit the word hip comes from a word an old English word for briar. Or brown you know, for you know for, for for thorny bush, yeah. So you know you can go with you can go with the native rose too if you like. And rose hips do make tea. So and rose hips make like tea, then you know you yeah, can many this. things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, before we move on to insects and pests, which is a is a big question. There's uh, Kenneth Privet asks, my roses are in pots. He has no yard, and he's heard that you um, that I should dig them up, thin out the roots, and replant when the rose goes dormant. Is that correct? Any plant, any plant growing in a container, you have to prune the roots. If you want to keep it in that same size container, you absolutely have to prune the roots. Okay. You take off about a third, okay? 
take yeah. off the dirt of the roots, put in new soil, and and let it go, and and then it starts growing again. Yeah. And and that might answer uh, Grisel Vera's question: what what to do when you're growing and inducing dormancy in containers? Is that related? Same thing. Same thing. Yep. Same you thing. Remove all the leaves, right? Right. And then uh, and then see you're going to see the latent buds in the in the canes are going to swell, and you're going to cut you're going to cut back the roses where the where the buds have have swollen, right? Making sure the buds face uh, to the outside. Okay, great. Now let's move on to the eternal question of insects and pests. Okay, so the first one is aphids and aphids. So whenever you read about roses, almost every time you say, you know, rose, aphids are really nothing to worry about. You can blast them off with a hose if you want. Insecticidal soap, which is non-toxic, is another way of controlling them. But there's really nothing to worry about. And uh, if you don't use any insecticide, you're going to have a lot of beneficial insects naturally coming in that are going to eat them mm -hmm. as well. Ladybugs mm -hmm. and lacewings and a lot of other uh, what they call carnivorous insects or per, uh, predaceous insects. Predaceous. To encourage these insects, by the way, keep either have a bird bath. By the way, birds are another good uh, insect control uh, uh, critter, right? Birds eat an enormous amount of insects every day. Have hummingbird feeders. They'll drive, drive, bring in the, the hummingbirds that are also going to feast on on insects. So that's those are some natural ways of controlling. I love how the, the excuse me this feeds into our past show about pollinators and and bringing, yeah, and bringing right, birds right. and pollinators yeah, exactly, in. Exactly. Right. Bringing the bees. Hmm. So then we have something called chili thrips, which is just something of a reason. The reason it's called chili thrips is because in the 1930s in hmm. India. Somebody first uh, documented the presence of thrips on chili, chili plants, right? The vegetable uh, chili, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but anyway, it's a real. It's a. It starts. It usually comes along in the real hot weather. It starts like maybe mm -hmm. in July, uh -huh. and they're very very difficult to get rid of. And again, Lauren uh, Zeldin, my good friend, he says, you know, if you're only going a few roses, like like I am. It's not going to be a problem. It's a problem if you're very ambitious and you have a lot of roses. Okay. Because uh -huh. again, you know, it's the congestion, right? The insects love it. If you are lacking for air circulation, for instance, if you're lacking, because air circulation is really critical in drying out the uh, moisture, even from the morning dew, right? Morning dew is enough to attract insects and, 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 and fungi. So, fungi. Interesting. so, anyway, there's a, there's a chemical called spinosad. It's not really a it's a natural product. It contains a bacteria that um, takes care of the chili thrips, but he says you have to get you have to use it concentrated. You can get spinosad in a, in a, in a kind of a spray bottle, but that's not going to do the trick. You have to get the concentrated product and uh, and apply it to the plant in order to in order to and you'll still have to reapply it every few weeks. So okay. it's a real nasty one. It's come along in recent years and not everybody's going to see it, but if you have a lot of roses, you probably will. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> on to spider mites. Spider mites. At first they're on the under, underside of the leaves. As they get more aggressive, if they haven't been treated, then they're going to, you're going to start seeing the webs. And here too, the, the best method of control is blasting with water and keeping the leaves clean because Spider mites uh, na uh, navigate to dust. They they form their uh, their colonies and they spin their webs where, where there's uh, uh, where there's dust. So you want to keep your you want to keep your 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 roses hose down uh, for that reason. There's actually and another reason we'll get to in a second. I just wanted to point out an interesting comment from from B. Prue who says Wasp, wasps eat thousands of insects a day. They're known as the organic gardener's friend. Right. So, okay, so he's talking about um, uh, parasitic wasps. Uh -huh. These are, or parasitic, they're tiny, microscopic. I, I'm glad he brought that up because that's another, um, it's a beneficial insect, which you want to attract to your garden. Whether you have, you can have a, uh, a bird bath, but you can also just put shallow dishes of water around your garden will oh, attract so beneficial insects. Because That's they need so moisture, okay. Yes. So that will that will you know, or you plant things that attract beneficial insects, things like marigolds, nasturtiums, 
you know, if you go online, you can find a whole bunch of plants. Anything with the, uh, anything with the, uh, um, in the, uh, uh, in the carrot family or the parsley, you know, those, that, that, whether it's parsley, carrots, dill, uh, cilantro, okay. All these plants with a, with a, uh, what do you call it? Ferny delicate foil? Yeah, they right. They attract beneficial insects too. Daisies, daisies attract beneficial insects. And the last awesome. one are mints, salvias and mints. So by planting these plants, you attract the beneficial insects that'll eat the insect pests. Yeah. Fascinating. Be before we leave off insects, I don't know whether this is going to be related or whether it's another answer, but Marsha Harris asks, she says, I have healthy roses with dark green leaves, but every once in a while, a leaf is solid yellow. Why? Ah. Okay, so that, if it's solid yellow, I mean, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, okay. Right, it happens, it's just, you know, for some reason, it didn't produce chlorophyll. There is a rose, vi you know, rose viruses are when it's kind of spotty, spotty yellow yeah. and green. But even okay. that is not necessarily fatal. It's a, you know, so the, the plant is a virus. It doesn't, it doesn't mean so, it, it's doomed. It, so Marsha, don't worry too much about your yellow leaf. No, I don't worry about it. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Let's move on. Okay, so there are three basic diseases and actually two of them are really our major concern because black spot, we don't see too much in California because it's very, very dry here, although you see it occasionally. Mildew, so, you know, in, in Southern California, we have what's called May gray and June bloom where the mornings can be very overcast, right? Yes, and it feels like you're living in Seattle sometimes. <laughs> so that is the perfect uh, 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 climate for, or the perfect weather for mildew because what happens is see that there's dew that settles on the leaves during the night mm -hmm. and that dew if there's a droplet of water on a leaf for four hours once the sun comes up that leaf is very susceptible to fungus uh -huh. so believe it or not one of the ways of doing this and they even use it i don't know if they still do it today but many years ago at the um the Huntington uh, Botanical Gardens in San Marino, they had overhead sprinklers. They would put them on in the morning to knock the fungal spores off of the leaves. Ah. Okay? Because you have to physically remove those spores, otherwise you're gonna get- Otherwise uh, you're gonna get You're them. gonna get mildew, right? And yeah. then you can also spray, once it, once it starts, you can spray with uh, horticultural or neem oil. Okay. Neem oil. Here we are again. Neem oil comes up almost. Neem oil comes up, right? That that, yeah. uh, that comes from uh, from a tropical tree, and uh, yeah, it's very effective in uh, in, uh, in in combating not only uh, uh, fungus but also insects. That's so we've talked about rust a little bit, but but you want to yeah. so rust that? again? I can say mildew stuff's in the top, right? But, and, but fungus is more about the bottom, like where there's not sufficient pruning so that mm -hmm. sun reaches all leaf surfaces and air circulates freely. So that's, you really want prevention. Mildew is not so bad. Mildew you can get rid of, or let's put it this way. Is the, is the, war, is the, war, is the, the, uh, the weather gets warmer and heats up, you're going to have less mildew. But uh -huh. rust is more, it's, 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 it's very persistent. Once you get it, so it, I mean, you have to either rub it off, right? There's just little orange bumps on the, on the or remove the leaves or, or you know and it's harder to do because if it's on the stems it's going to be on the lower part so how are you going to you know you'd have to cut off the whole stem and yeah. sometimes really the rust make the plant might just be a loss for that season and uh you just want to turn it all off and give start it a, over start over next year yeah yeah and then oh rugosa roses i know somebody phoned in a question about what they can what roses can grow on big bear and Rosa rugosas, they're, rugosa roses, they're excellent because of their resistant to disease, but also their cold tolerance. So if you're looking for roses for really cold places, I mean, there are a lot of other ones you'll find on the internet. Well, that was the question. I, I just want to give a shout out. Susan Burrell asked what to grow at high altitude. That's what you're referring to. So, yeah. so I would start with the rugosas. I don't know if you've ever been in Manhattan. There's a neighborhood called Battery Park City. Oh, yeah. Right? That's just, just wall, I didn't say wall to wall, but they have, they have, they have large areas planted to grow some roses. You know how cold it gets in Manhattan. Oh yeah. Those are definitely suitable for, for Big Bear. And again, I, if you go on the internet and search sub-zero roses, you're going to find lots and lots of them. 
so fascinating to me that they can grow in such such yeah. a range of habitats. Right. Yeah, I grew up in New Mexico and my grandmother, we were at 7,000 feet out, out by Santa Fe and my grandmother well, was, was growing white roses. There you go. There you yeah. go. And, so uh, moving on. Yeah. Uh, now there is a product. It's not organic. I have to, I have to say. Um, but if you apply it, there's a granular preparation. You know, you rake away your mulch. You just, mm -hmm. any kind of fertilizer, but because it also fertilizes. Where do you want to spread it? You want to spread it on the drip line. What is the drip line? The drip line is the, is the canopy perimeter of a tree or a shrub, right? In other words, if your oh. rose uh, shoots, canes, if they go out three feet, if there's three feet between one uh, end of the, of the rose and the other, right? So you, you're going to have a circle, right? I guess one and a half feet from the from the trunk of the rose or the main stems of the rose. So you're going to you're going to put down this preparation or any other fertilizer for that matter along that drip line, right? You're going to make it in that circle, okay? Now the granular product of BioAdvance it controls all the diseases we mentioned and all the pests except spider mites. Now there's a liquid preparation, and obviously that you're going to want to spray on. Mm -hmm. which controls spider mites as well. And this is on both, whether you're using the granule or the liquid, they recommend it every six weeks. So that's Let one me. product. And again, I think we've addressed everything really in a way that you don't have to use um, a product like this. But, you know, for some people, if they just, they don't want to have the headaches, okay, every six weeks I'm putting this around my roses, forget about everything. And, I'm just curious, um, Joshua, for a product like that, are there any toxicity concerns for other plants? I'm thinking of the question earlier. Uh, no, I mean, look, anytime you spray something, you want to make sure you confine it to the, to the rose. But actually, no, look at the label, rose and flower care. What does that tell uh, you? It tells wow. you other plants are included and on their label, they're going to tell you which plants are included. Okay. okay. And I would imagine if it, if it, doesn't, if it's non-toxic to roses, it's probably going to be non-toxic to, uh, to other plants as well. Right. Great. Uh, one question Mary Gabe just uh, shot in. She said she wants to know how often to fertilize her tea roses. Would it be the same for any yeah, what, what yeah, we yeah, talked yeah. about yeah. earlier? Okay, yeah, that's absolutely. what we talked about earlier yeah. once a month. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, moving on. So here we come to propagation. Uh, I love this. Uh, this was so Which interesting. Which is really, you know, it's a lot easier than you might think, right? Yeah. And... There are softwood cuttings, hardwood, semi-hardwood and hardwood, and they all, they all root. The key is any kind of cutting that you take. And here there's a nice little uh, picture, thanks to Julie Collette. We have to give her a lot of shout out. She's the one who finds all this. I mean, I just- Ju her... <laughs> Just so you know, everybody, Julie Corlett is our Oz behind the curtain. She's our production manager who finds really? all of these things. Really? So thank you, Julie. She comes up with all these brilliant slides. I, I, you know, so anyway, the thing you want to remember, whatever cutting you take, you want to dip it in, in, in uh, uh, rooting hormone, which you can get in any, um, any nursery and probably in the home improvement centers as well. It's organic. I mean, it's the same hormone that, that occurs naturally in roots and they've just isolated it and they made it into a powder form. So you just dip the cuttings in it so, and make sure, however, that the hole, you want to make it the hole with a pencil or something because you don't want to put the, the you don't want to just insert the cutting into the soil because what will happen is the rooting hormone will rub off. Okay? Ah. So you want to make sure when you put it in, you put it in little... with space around it and then you sort of firm in the soil around it. Uh -huh. But so we have a photo here of the hardwood, right? And you know, the longer as the season progresses, the 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 the, the growth hardens, right? And early in the season, it's soft and it gets semi hardwood. But I love this picture of the you know, the Starbucks uh, containers. Uh, the day yeah, the containers. So they have a hole in the top, you know. Yeah, the yeah. And I mean, one thing you want to be aware of, and you know, any type of cutting, you know, you, you repurpose your your plastic containers. You don't have to go buy anything. The only thing you want to be aware of is that they need drainage. So any uh, container like this, you want to take a um, you want to take a pencil or something. You want to poke holes in the bottom, right? So they'll have uh -huh. uh, drainage when when and the moisture won't accumulate. But it's like a mini greenhouse, you know. I love that. I love and so, that. And so they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna benefit from that. Rather than throwing them away and yeah. filling a landfill, you can use them to to propagate something beautiful. I love that. 
Yeah. Okay, Julie, what's the next slide? Aha, I love this too. Please. So anyway, so here's like, this is sort of the lazy man's um, <laughs> propagation. I'm <laughs> all for that. Let, tell me, tell me. You don't have to remove anything from the plant. For the first, so trench layering, you, you dig a little trench, you take a shoot from the rose and you bend it down, right? And you take like a little U-nail to keep it in place, okay? Uh -huh. And then you put a stone to remind you where, where, you, where you buried it. And then you just water it. And what's gonna happen, you can see uh, on the right, there's a little shoot with the roots are gonna start coming out of that stem. And then you're just gonna cut it, right? To the, to the, the mother plant side, right? You're gonna mm -hmm. dig out you know, in, a, in a month or two and you're gonna see root and then you have another plant, right? And so you just, you dig it up and you can put it in another part of your garden, you can put it in a container, you can give it to a friend, whatever you want. That's Got called it. trench line. Then we have it called air layering. It's a fancy word for that mar cottage. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that word, who knows? But anyway, so this, <laughs> you remove all, you, you remove the outer, um, the outer bark, right? And even the outer, uh, uh, um, you know, all the outer stuff, until you come to the stem, right? Uh -huh. The inner stem, you want to call it that. And you cover that, and then you take peat moss, and you, you put it in a plastic bag, right? And you, you, you secure it around the, uh, you put two holes in it, right? So you can, you can uh -huh. put, it on, put it on to the, to the, to the stem. And then you take uh -huh. a couple of ties and what's gonna happen is roots are gonna come out of the top of that, uh, the stem, they're gonna come out. You're gonna see them growing in that bag. And then you just cut it off at the bottom and you got yourself another rose bush, so. No kidding. Yeah, That's I mean, so you can do that with a lot of plants. So like plants that are different, difficult to propagate, especially certain fruit trees. Mm -hmm. That's really mm -hmm. the preferred uh, method of, of propagation method. because That's it's so not, you know, yeah. Anyway. Um, hey, we have an interesting question uh, that differs a little bit from propagation. Just just to take a, a small moment, Ken, uh, Kenneth Privet asks again, what is a good deer repellent? Ah, well, that's a very good question. I'm glad. <laughs> that's kind of a myth. It's a Really? He said, well, let me, let me, let, just let, let, let me, let me, let me, oh, go ahead. because I know from experience, I've, you know, over at, um, uh, again, over at the, uh, well, this was the Sconzo Gardens. I'm pretty, was uh -huh. it the Gardens? It, yeah. Over at the Sconzo Gardens. They, you know, they have a problem with, with, with deer, right? They have a big rose garden there and they have deer. And if I'm not mistaken, it's been a few years, but they have a, something called a, um, uh, a filament, a, fil a, a, a filament barrier, which is really interesting. Thing. They stretch um, fishing tackle, fishing line between two posts at the height of a deer. So a deer oh, would exactly. walk into that and it would, it would feel the resistance and walk away. Ah, well, that's, well, that's a, a filament good, that's barrier. A good filament barrier. Right. But, but that's a great note. He said he says that uh, when he lived in Northern California, the roses were candy for the deer. Absolutely. Yeah. From everything I've learned over the years, the only thing that keeps deer out deer out is a fence. If you really want to put it, there's no other you're calling it. I know people make a fortune out of uh, um, selling deer repellent. You know, some yeah. people get deer urine. They think that keeps them away. Yeah. Or they, you've heard this? Coyote urine. Yeah, coyote oh, no. urine. None of it works. None Doesn't work. Works. Yeah. The, yeah, the dogs work well. Let me tell you, dogs work well. Anyway, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Not to go down to that rabbit hole. Is, is there anything yeah. you really need to say about propagation from seed? Yeah. So seed, the only thing you, have to, you need to say, that the most important thing to keep in mind is that they need cold. Okay. Uh -huh. I like it. You know that, that first song by by you know called the Rose, where it says, um, uh, you know, beneath the snow lies a seed that becomes, the, becomes rose. the rose. Well, it's not just. I, I really. Like, I mean, it's you know, there's a lot Come of. Come on, metaphor. sing it for us, man. Say, I'm <laughs> there's a lot of metaphor, right? Because it's like you know we've gone through this long winter of COVID, and now we're coming out of it, and this and that. But. The truth is for a rose seed to germinate, it needs cold. So what you do is when you take the seeds out of your hips, well, first you want to clean them with bleach and so forth. You want to put them in the refrigerator for four to six weeks because that is going to um, mimic winter. the weather, the, the winter, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so you do that and then, and then they're ready to spread. In fact, 
you'll see them sprouting in the refrigerator. How fabulous. When you know they're ready to go, and then you plant them out. In my house, knowing my husband, he probably put them in a salad. But anyway, <laughs> let's mo moving on, we've only got a few more minutes left, so I want to make sure we get to everything important. Oh, okay. So this is propagation by tea bud. You know, this is how it's done in the nursery, okay? But, you know, you can do it yourself. And so you, you see A is a shoot. And what you do is you take a knife. It's actually, they have uh, a pruning uh, propagation knives that look just like that. You scrape out a, a bud. And then you make a T, you cut the, the bark on the, on, the, uh, on the stem where you want to propagate. So you take this bud out and you put it in. Now, why do you want to do that? There's some people who have a rose bush that's growing three or four different roses, okay? You can do that. You take a yellow rose, a pink rose, a red rose, and a purple rose, right? And you put them all on the same plant. Love that. Go out. And then, you know, you put it in and then you take like, they also, you know, go online, say, you know, propagation knife, propagation uh, 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 rubber bands. And, and you, you know, cause you, you want to enclose into the rubber band to keep it really tight. So no moisture escape. And there you see what happens in a couple of weeks, you're already starting to see new growth. Uh, nature is so amazing. Okay. Uh, next one. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? I think we'll let that go because it's okay. That's I a mean, lot to know, get into. It's not, you don't have to be a, a, a rocket scientist to hybridize your roses. It's, Love anybody that. can do it. You just take a Love small that. paper. Though. Now, this oh. is kind of important about, you know, if you want to increase the life of your roses, you cut them off the, the plant, right? It, again, you want to do this in the morning, early morning as possible. And you put them in water and you cut a quarter inch off the bottom and immediately you put it into your, well, you put the roses in water. Of course, you want to take all the bottom leaves off, right? I mean, flower arranging in general, you never want to have any leaves submerged in water because that invites fungus. Right. Anyway, you cut it and and then you put it into your arrangement, okay? You put it into your arrangement. In other words, the water, the reason you do that is because that prevents air bubbles from getting into the, uh, the xylem, which is, you know, how, which water is up. If an air bubble gets in there, then the rose is going to wilt very quickly. By doing this, you ensure that the rose is going to go longer. And then, of course, they also have there's other, other tricks of the trade. And again, you can come back and look at this at your leisure. You want to add the container a, a, a preservative, right? One quart hot water, one teaspoon sugar, a few drops of bleach. The bleach keeps the, the fungus uh, or the bacteria from growing. Mm -hmm. And it, you want to do this at night, actually, and then transfer to a vase the next day. It actually does work. But I have been killing my roses before their time. This yeah, is exactly. So interesting. <laughs> I really have. So, Julie, let's move on to the next slide. We've only got a, a couple more minutes left. Yeah, so this is just uh, to let you know, roses don't have to grow on their own. You can grow with, uh, with lots of ground covers. Uh, yeah, my friend uh, Lauren Zeldin, he uses, uh, he, he, he has a, a, a larkspur or annual delphinium growing, beautiful dark blue uh, flowers all over the rose garden. But here are a couple of examples. You have white clematis, which is a vining plant. It, it's a very, the roots are not invasive. It grows from anywhere. Um, actually, it's funny. This is, I think it's a red rose with a white, but whatever. And then anything that's violet or lavender grows very well with pink roses. You know, pink is the favorite color of roses. Not a surprise. Um, and then you have the Lady Banks rose with the wisteria, the, the yellow and the purple. And, you know, they both bloom early in the spring. So this is a really good, uh, really good combination. Yeah. Great. Love it. And then okay. where to get everything? Yeah. So here, here are like probably the five most notable uh, mail order nurseries along the top. And then underneath, I want to bring your attention. It's in uh, Ventura County. It's called Otto and Sons. I would say in Southern California, they pro it's probably the most um, noteworthy nursery for roses. In fact, I, I think I could say it is the most noteworthy retail where you can just go in and see a lot of different roses and get them. It's in Mendora County. And uh, that, that's one where you can't get from mail order. You can order them online and then just go and pick them up, but they don't ship them out. All the other roses, mostly you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, bare root, and containerized roses um, uh, of the of the five uh, company mail order companies on top. 
That sounds great. We had a couple questions on where to get roses, and here we are. We're, and I should we're just answering mention, that heirloom question. roses are, are actually not all heirloom, but they're all grown on their own roots. None of them are grafted. So right. that that's special because usually the roots plants on their own roots are tougher than ones that are grafted. That sounds good. Okay, we're about we're about at the end, my friend. Um, ah, oh, we glad you brought it. This is really the best. I think I mentioned it before, but if you have you $10 did. or $11, you don't know what to do with and you love roses, <laughs> go online, you get this book used. It's the, You'll never have to look at another book about how to grow roses. I love this. Okay, well, uh, this is always an education. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending. That's really all the time we have. Rem remember Joshua's column runs in Saturday's paper and online in our publications. His website is the smarter, excuse me, the smartergardener.com. And if you want more gardening insights from our experts, sign up for our garden party newsletter. And, and you know what, if you've missed anything or if you've missed our last episodes, now is a great time to catch up on our virtual programs. Go to scng.com forward slash virtual events. And really important, if you'd like to share your thoughts from today or you have additional questions or just wanna make any comments, please email us at events at scng.com. We love to hear from you. Please tune into our program next month. And hey, if you're not a subscriber, but you wanna get in on all the entertainment and information we offer, uh, give us a call at 877-469-6133. Again, thank you for your support and we will see you next time. And, oh, wait, before I forget, May 20th uh, is our next bo bookish program. And we've got Don Winslow and, and uh, a couple other fantastic authors to, to, uh, for you to enjoy. Thanks again, Joshua. We'll see thank you next you. time. Thank Back you. to the garden. <laughs> Ciao.